welcome to Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society's Young Glaucoma Expert Program. I'm Miss Nee from Jilalongkorn University, Bangkok, Thailand. I'm the moderator and the mentor for today's educational activity. APGS endeavors to foster an environment where our junior colleagues can benefit from the expertise and experiences of the professors invited to participate as mentors. This is meant to help develop and assist with your clinical research and clinical practice. And before we get started, I would like to go over a few items. APGS welcomes everyone to become a member of the society. It is open to glaucoma specialists, um, ophthalmologists, researchers, trainees, specialists, associates, and companies with affiliation in glaucoma. And there are many reasons to join APGS, and on three are just a few items which we can share with you. You can register as a member by scanning this QR code. All APGS members gain access to all recordings of the previous APGS joint symposiums, masterclasses, and webinars. One final disclaimer. Presentations are intended to, for educational purposes only and do not replace any independent professional judgment. And after the conclusion of the event, you will receive a short feedback survey, and we would really appreciate if you can take a moment to complete it. Certificate of attendance will be issued after the completion of the survey. APGS extends its gratitude towards Santen for its continuous support towards APGS activities, including today's webinar. And finally, before we begin with the webinar proper, I would like to remind you that you only have a few days left to submit an abstract for the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress to be held in May 2024 in the Philippines. And the deadline to submit abstract is on Friday, the 1st of December. Next, let's begin with the presentation from Assistant Professor Poman Chan on the impact of PAPS in glaucoma treatment and the emotions of the EP2 agonist. Commission is an assistant professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong or CUHK, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science. He is also the glaucoma coordinator of the CUHK Ophthalmic Microsurgical Training Program. Internationally, he is a member of the World Glaucoma Association or the UGA Associate Advisory Board, a committee member of the Global Outreach Committee of the UGA. He is the first certified trainer of iStand, Sanjiao Stand, and Microchain in Hong Kong. He is also a section leader and section author of the fourth edition of the EPGS guideline. And now everyone, please welcome Professor Shen. Thank you very much. Um, um, so everyone see my slide, I hope. <clears throat> so um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the kind introduction. So. Um, I'm going to talk briefly talk about because uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about ocular surface disease today. So I'm going to keep you talk about how the challenges that we we face when we are assessing patients with ocular surface disease for glaucoma patients. So these are my financial disclosure, <clears throat> and I would like to thank my my colleagues and my seniors, and also especially the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Guidelines um, for for the for some of the materials which will be included, and some of the material that I presented today will be included in the next editions of the guidelines. So briefly, what I'm going to talk about today uh, in the next 15 minutes or so is the uh, prevalence and severity of ocular surface disease in glaucoma patients, uh, the preservatives in glau uh, glaucoma medications, the diagnosis and assessment of uh, ocular surface disease among glaucoma patients, and also the challenges that we face when we're assessing OSD uh, amongst these patients. Now, even back in 10 years ago, uh, if you look at the European Glaucoma Society guidelines, uh, it says that the goal of glaucoma treatment is to maintain the patient's visual function and the related quality of life at a sustainable cost. So cost effectiveness, quality of life was already in the agenda right 10 years ago. <clears throat> However, if, if you're in the field long enough, you might notice that um, uh, the year before that, I mean, you know, 20, say for example, before, 10 years before or, 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 or 20 years ago, people tend not to talk too much about the quality of life. They, they tend to be more cautious about you know, how to control the pressure, uh, whether the controlling the pressure would uh, reduce the, 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 um, the speed of the visual field uh, defect. So 
people are talking about preserving the visual function without really relating that to the quality of life. And nowadays, we, as, as the treatment is getting better and better, um, we are also talking about quality of life and also the sustainable cost. Because we know that as, as, as time goes along, we, we start to notice that <clears throat> side effect of the medications is one of the problem. Uh, is actually becomes a major problem uh, in terms of the treatment uh, and also the major component of protecting the patient's quality of life. Now, <clears throat> prostaglandin analog, of course, is still the first line therapy, of, although I'm sure you know that um, uh, SLT nowadays is getting uh, more of the first lines and some, some, some centers or some of the patients would apply uh, SLT as the first uh, treatment option. However, PGA still has a role and uh, is still the first line treatment. It's effective, it's convenient, only used once a day. Um, and also the uh, efficacy is, 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 is pretty good. Uh, the effect is also predictable. However, if you look at the side effect profile, you notice that ocular surface disease is an important side effect profile. Um, <clears throat> if you look at this, uh, and also along with the whole list of side effect, you notice that a lot of them are actually just ocular surface disease. Now, these include conjunctival hyperemia, burning sensation, foreign burning sensation, itching, etc. Um, <clears throat> and also, of course, uh, particularly for prostaglandin, we are more emphasizing on the, the PEPs nowadays, the prostaglandin associated perioperatopathy, which we won't talk about a decade ago, but it's getting increasingly uh, more emphasized. And we even have grading system with the PEPs nowadays. Systemic effect also is a concern, uh, but we're not going to talk about that today. Now, ocular surface disease and, and PEPs is important. Uh, it affects the quality of life, although um, it's, it's, it's one of the side effects that, well, perhaps the doctors and the patients might think they have to bear uh, because they need to maintain their visual function. But if you look at some of the literature, it says that the quality of life and utility loss as a result of severe side effect from glaucoma medication is actually comparable to the, that result from a decrease in 10 decibel in the median in the mean deviation of the visual field. So you're talking about something of an early stage to the moderate stage glaucoma uh, visual field defect. And if you think about it, uh, patients already suffering from visual field defect and you're adding that particular deduction of the quality of life on the patients, uh, it might not be all that nice. Now, talking about the quality of life, if you relate that to the um, to the different stages of glaucoma, as shown on the uh, extreme left column, you notice that um, um, you notice that in early stage and moderate stage, the quality of life, overall, the health utility of the patient is actually not that bad. All right, if they have the central vision preserved, so um, the range goes from one to zero. Zeros mean death, and one is perfect health. So you're talking about um, a 0.9 um, health utility for patients with moderate glaucoma uh, as a lower limit. So it's not really that bad as far as the patient's whole perception is concerned. Um, however, it's, it's, it's not justifiable not to treat these patients. So, you know, you, you, we fall in the dilemma of how we should treat the patient, what sort of extent we go uh, in terms of the treatment. Um, of course, as time goes along, we have um, we have combination therapy, we have uh, preservative free medication developing, and hopefully that would uh, also uh, smoothen the side effect problem, uh, especially ocular surface disease. Ocular surface disease obviously um, is 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 multifactorial, um, and is a multifactorial disorder, including conjunctival epithelium affecting the cornea epithelium, the primal gland, and also the mobilian gland. And that leads to a deficiency or inappropriate tear production, and that would lead to a decrease in the visual acuity and ocular discomfort. It affects up to 60% of the glaucoma patients. And OSD actually, as I said, negatively impacts the patient's uh, medication adherence and quality of life, and also affect the future filtration surgery outcome, which uh, I'm, I'm quite sure is going to be talked about later on in, in this presentation. And also the ocular service uh, some says that ocular surface inflammation causes an intense, it, it intensified the wound healing response. Um, and so that increases the, the failure of the flare. Uh, multiple medication, of course, would increase the chance and also the symptoms and severity of OSD. Now, if you look at um, various different medications, the major component of the 
uh, OST comes from the, the the preservatives, and the major uh, pre content of the preservative is the BAK, the benzoconium chloride. Now, if you go um, and Google it and look in the Wikipedia, uh, benzoconium chloride, uh, it's in fact in, involved in a lot of different um, uh, specialty too. Now, it's it's actually uh, it's contained in uh, laundry detergents and um, softening softeners of textiles. Uh, skin antiseptics and even cleaners for floors and hard surface as a, de as a disinfectant. All right, surgical disinfectant too. So you can imagine how bad uh, BAK is uh, and putting that into the bottle uh, so that the patient can apply them uh, is, 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 is unimaginable. Uh, it is, it, it could, but it is, it is necessary to, it, to some extent in the past because um, of course you need to preserve the medications and also, you need to weaken the conjunctiva and all the surface, ocular surface, in a way, in order to let the drugs to get into the eye. And that was the the whole point of the BAK to start off with. Of course, nowadays we have other formula and also other preservative-free formula. Manifestation-wise, is basically like dry eyes. So superficial pumptic keratitis, the tear film instability, allergy, pseudo pemphigoid dry eyes, and vertex. Uh, keratopathy is something that you can find in the textbooks. Um, importantly, um, how to assess this, 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 um, the OSD is challenging because uh, glaucoma patients they have uh, they have their problems too. So it could be quite non-specific. So I, I suggest that is you have to ask, you really have to ask the patient. I think the examination part is important, but it might not be directly correlating to the patient's. Uh, own feeling. So <clears throat> you have to really uh, pay attention in the history. Ask about the dry eye symptoms, the redness, the the allergy, whether or not it causes photophobia. Is it is would the OSD symptoms actually affect the patient's drug compliance? You know, ask them. You know, tell them honestly. Just tell me. You know, um, would you would you try to skip some of the drops because you don't feel comfortable about? I mean, is 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 patient tend to be. Um, well, typically patients tend not to tell you the truth in, in that case because they worry about, especially for Asian patients, they worry about being told off by, by the doctors. But you just have to be very honest with them and say, look, you know, not drug and non-hearance is, is fairly common. So just be very honest to me. I'm trying to help you. Tell me, is it affecting your drug adherence? All right. This is important because they might not tell you. Um, and also the uh, ask about whether they have any pre-existing condition before they have they, they start the glaucoma medication. Perhaps the patient already have dry eyes uh, to start off with, and the drop the drops is actually making them feel worse about it. And some patient even bother feel bothered by the OSD. But then you know it could be quite sort of minor um, in terms of their perception. So they, they they feel it's not right, but they they won't be able to tell you because they thought that this is part of the treatment. So especially for the for the for the for the elderly. All right, they listen to us. Um, they're very respectful to us, and they 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 don't they just don't want to upset the treatment. They thought that they think that this is something they have to do or something they have to bear with. Um, important to address that because you have to tell them, look, there are something else we can do. Um, let's work work together and see what we can do about the OSD. Examination wise, uh, the standard cornea sensations, uh, breakup time, cornea, um, the uh, stain the cornea. Uh, and see whether or not there is any functal epithelial erosion. Do the Schumer's test. And I would also suggest, especially look for the blepharitis too. Uh, Mobodium gland dysfunction is very common after prolonged use of medications. Um, and also there is, this is the osmometer, which I don't use, but uh, it's, it's something that you might be able to use to document the patient's, um, uh, the, the, the patient's evaporation rate um, to check for the hypoosmolarity. And also, if you're doing study, uh, these are some of the other examination investigation that we don't tend we tend not to do in our uh, daily practice, but um, it could be helpful to document the patient's problem, including oxide grading, um, which again is not very commonly used, probably used in studies. Um, I personally find OSDI fairly useful. Uh, it's it's so it's not just a score. It's a whole list of questions that you would be able to ask the patients in order to screen for any problem. Other questionnaire including the speed and also the sandy, and also the 
uh, keratography, uh, which again is more specific for 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 research purpose, and in uh, and also uh, imaging the meibolium gland. So this oscimeter, which I I copied these uh, photos from from the website, uh, just for your reference. Personally, I don't use it. I have no financial interest in this uh, in this particular machine. And oxygen grading um, is in your textbook. I don't see. <clears throat> I don't. I, I I sometimes use it for my studies, but well, to be honest, it doesn't really quite correlate with the patient's own feeling. You, you can see patient with quite horrifying grade panel D grade three um, oxygen grading, but they don't really feel much. Some of them. Now this is the OSDI. I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, quite helpful in terms of the list, um, <clears throat> and um, actually quite uh, quite easy to use too. So um, perhaps it's a good list for you to screen for your patients to see whether the 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 the, the dry eyes and the OSD is actually affecting their, their their problems or not, and also the speed and also the sandy. Uh, just to show you what the keratography uh, can do. All right, the non-invasive tear breakup time. Uh, and also the content type of hyperemia, the tear meniscus height. Well, you know, again, more uh, for the purpose of research. I don't think the figures really help you that much in terms of the practice um, and monitoring. Um, MIPO score could be helpful, all right? Um, just a way to document how bad the, the, the peripheritis and the volume gland dysfunction is. And um, it's not really part of the OSD, but uh, Perhaps it's helpful to 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 be to mention about perhaps it's getting more important now. Uh, this is a screen cap I I got from one of the draft of the of the coming upcoming um, APGS uh, guidelines. Uh, so uh, there are many di different grading systems, but the the SU perhaps grading system uh, could be quite simple and helpful. So basically the grading goes by one two three four. All right, no cosmetic change, so no perhaps. Or superficial cosmetic change. All right, so just the just the ugly look and the pigmentation and the eyelash growth. Deep cosmetic change bothering the patient's uh, social social problem, but not really affecting the treatment and the tonometry, perhaps, which would actually I'm sure you would you, you have encountered these patients. Very tight um, ptosis uh, eyelid and actually affecting your measurement of. Of the of 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 the of the intraocular pressure with the Goldman, and also affecting your your surgery. So coming to so coming to the diagnosis is is tough because uh, both glaucoma and OSD uh, reduce quality of life. So you, it's very difficult to dissect which one is which, um, which one is predominating. Uh, however, um, if you go back to this table that I I just shown you before. Sorry about that. Um, remember, the early and moderate glaucoma, they don't really have that much problem in terms of the quality of life, all right? Um, so it's a matter of balance. And, whoops, sorry. And so you, you have to justify whether, whether or not to start multiple medication for those patients with pre-glaucoma and early glaucoma status. Perhaps sometimes it's, um, it's, it's okay if, you, if the pressure is, doesn't reduce as much, but then you want to monitor the patient properly um, <clears throat> or more intensively in, instead of just giving a particular target intraocular pressure without, without, um, without proving whether that is, that is important for that particular patient or not, okay? And also the effect of glaucoma versus the OSD, all right? That is, again, the, the problems of assessing the patient. Now, if you look at assessment tools in some of the studies, major studies, uh, they have the, the European Quality of Life, five dimensions, and also the National Eye Institute uh, Visual Function Questionnaire. Now, these are very sophisticated uh, tools, um, and the details are here. I'm not going to bop you, bop you down in the details, but the, the, the key message is they could be quite complicated to use. And if you look at some of the um, key uh, multi center trials, the light trial and the text trials, um, it's very difficult, even with massive amount of sample size, it's very difficult for them to dissect whether or not there's significant differences of the scores between the different treatment groups. So um, for the EQ5D scores, there's no significant differences in terms of the score between the uh, the patients underwent eye drops or the SLT 
or those patients who underwent tropidectomy versus those with uh, medication management. So take home messages, uh, the effect of OSD on glaucoma patient, it could be difficult to quantify, but it's, it's also very important. The basic principle is, uh, go back to the basic principle, is how would you like to treat your relative or yourself? All right, what would you prefer? Um, many times you can you can easily um, pin, finger point at the patient and say, well, look, you know, you have to be compliant, uh, otherwise you go blind, uh, otherwise the glaucoma deteriorate. But how, how about if that is your relative or, or your, your parents or yourself? How would you like to be treated? I think sometimes going, I, think, I know this is all cliche, but sometimes going back to that sort of mentality really helps to help to manage your patient properly. And in your practice, forget about the figures for one moment. All right, all these figures from the light trials, um, you you're talking about your own patients, the patients right in front of you. Um, so ask your patient what they really want. Uh, ask properly in the history, are, the, are those symptoms actually bothering them? And then do so, uh, encounter so accordingly. And also, it's all about communication. There's no really real hard and fast rule in terms of the assessment. That, but the list is there. Uh, but then, you know, how extensive do you want to do this assessment? Uh, or whether or not these figures really help your management? This is the message that you would like to ask uh, in, your, in, your, in your clinical practice. So that's it on my part. Um, thank you very much. I hope it's helpful. Thank you, Pawan. Thank you, Pawan, for that excellent talk. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you have mentioned a lot, mainly on the OSD in the glaucoma patients. So I think uh, we've got a few uh, questions from now. And uh, yes, I see some of the questions from the audience, but not, uh, um, I mean, actually not friendly related to the OSD. So I go with a, a couple of questions from the uh, that related to the OSD first. I think, um, I mean, Paul, I'm just wondering, and how many of your patients that come into you and uh, complains about their OSD symptoms? I mean, uh, for I you mean, yourself in your practice. Yeah, um, it depends. I mean, I, I do. I, I have some private patient. I have some some patient of the public, 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 the public too. I think they, they they behave quite differently, and also the age group too. So uh, some of them are very picky. And they would uh, it, once you start the medication, they would they would tell you, look, I'm I'm having this blurry vision after applying the drops. It's, it's not helping me. Um, that especially for the for those who doesn't really feel the glaucoma facial field defect. So um, you, they might think that you know you you basically sort of harming them. But for me, they might not complain as much nowadays because whenever I start the medication, I tell I I, I would tell them, look. You might feel worse after after mm -hmm. starting the meds. So you know, bear with me. There's a side effect. These are the side effects that you might face. All right. It might serve to scare them, but you know, it also give them the expectation. And so, if right. you, if, if my experience is, if you just give the drugs and say, "Well, look, you have glaucoma. Start the medications. I come back to you. I will get back to you in two months' time and see how the pressure goes." They will come back and complain. You know, look, I'm not feeling comfortable. Or they won't say a word, but then you never know what happens behind the scenes. They might not even apply the drops, or they apply the drops a few days before they come to you. Um, so it's it's like you know us turning up to dentists. You, you brush your teeth properly before you go. So um, um, that is something we 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 have to look up for. Um, yeah. Multiple medications is is the problem. Um, so those patients, two drops, three drops. Those are the people who start complaining. Um, so it's quite extreme. You see these red eye patients uh, don't complain uh, sometimes because they thought that you know I need it. But uh, there, there are patients who has no 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 sign at all to start complaining. Um, I would say if you talk about percent, I would say about forty percent actually complain about eye drops, but only if you ask. If you don't ask, they, they don't really talk about it. Yes, I agree because I think uh, some patients, you know, comes and go, and they don't, they don't complain or they don't say anything about, you know, the adverse events. And uh, sometimes we have to ask and we have to do the examination whether what is going on with them 
because sometimes you, you know they they are so uh, humble to ask and to complain to the doctors, right? I, I think all, all, uh, the, for the Asian for the Asian guys, I think uh, the patients always have a very high threshold for pain or anything that happening to them. Yes, and uh, so for the examination for you yourself in your practice, because you know for the dry eye for the OSD, there are a lot that suggested in the textbook or you know from the literatures. But for yourself, because in your own practice, what size or what examination that you do uh, for you know help confirm yourself about this patient, uh, the, the OSD to this patients. And so for our young uh, experts can, you know, adapt this examination for their practice. Right, and so see seeing the history, I just, I just, I don't really have a list in my mind, but I would naturally ask those questions that, that is right. seen on the eye. So those, those are actually quite helpful. Um, and um, for examination, really, I don't, I don't really have specific you know, I, I list out all this uh, keratography and I don't actually do it. I do it for some of my research patients, but myself, I, I just do the slit lamb really. And and of course, um, I think the staining is important. I mean, if, if the patient don't even complain, but you know, you see mm -hmm. use, uh, yes, yes. Here, then you know there's a problem. Um, the shim, uh, not, not even the shimmers sometimes. Um, I, I'm, mm -hmm. just, I'm just late, but I think the shimmers is helpful. Um, and I, I do pay a lot of attention to the mobilium gland, actually. I, I, I do look for the proprietors uh, quite often because I think this is one thing that the patient uh, can help themselves by, by doing proper, proper lit hygiene. Um, and, um, and I think more importantly is really you ask instead of just doing this, the examinations. They don't, re they don't always correlate. Um, yeah. Yeah, and just about this, uh, the staining on the cornea, and how's about the lid and something else? Because, you know, uh, 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 other myography or anything, I think it's to take, taking too much time and usually in the in the research things, sort of things. But um, uh, how's about the lid? And uh, if the patients, for me myself, I think if the patient has some kind of the cornea, this cornea problem as well as the lid problem, just like we, they have this, uh, long-standing blepharitis and with the crack stain over the eyelashes so i think i need to change something for yourself for yourself do you think that uh, this is going to be something that you have to change your modality of treatment like uh, from medications into others just like laser or surgery yeah yeah the lids the lids I, I i do care a lot especially for the for, for the blepharitis i think right. i don't know what happened but, but in, in my days there the, the, he especially for professor, professor dennis lamb i mean he yes. he, looked, he spent a lot of time looking at the lids <laughs> i didn't know why, but, but it, it turns out to be really helpful because um pathologists tend not to, not to pay okay. attention about the lids um and and one day you know when when the doctor tell the patient look you have some problems with the arthritis and and they they all sort of or jump into surprise and you know they realize that something is going on and for me if if the blepharitis is severe i will switch drops i will switch to preservative free or mm -hmm. or, or even consider slt or or, or, or the mix so yeah. these are the things that i would do right and uh, because uh, we know the osd has an effect or the surgical outcome so if you if you change into other modalities uh, and and how do you prepare your patients uh, for such as for the traffic colectomy or any subconjunctival mix or anything else that the blip best surgery and uh, I know what kind of you know preparations of the surface that you would do before uh, putting the patients on surgery yeah I give, I give some i give some lotamax um to to smooth yes. in the thing. hopefully the pressure won't go up and mm -hmm. uh, so try to limit the, the drops. Sometimes I give I give them the drop holidays, so you know I give them yes. diamox, um, right? To, so that right. so that time, um, and also ask them to do the proper lip cleansing. Uh, with stasis, I don't you know the cyclosporin. I I don't always do, but you know extreme situation I might. Um, of course, the preservative free uh, eye lubricants too. That's something I would do. 
Yes, that is that's a good tip. You know, drug holiday or preservative free, and somehow you need, uh, uh, you know, the anti-inflammatory before you, you send the patients into the OT. Well, then uh, I've got uh, we've got you know the the com uh, sorry the question from from the patients, but may not um, just very early may not be related, but uh, please help them. Um, they they say that they have patients sixty years old and the VA. I think in both eyes, six six, and with the uh, this with the normal zero point three, uh, but the perimetry has some beginning of the inferior scrotum of both eyes, anchor closed, open on dynamic both eyes. I'm not sure about this one, but uh, TIO ODS, what is that? Um, Thirteen to fourteen, and the uh, question is, should we advise for laser eye dotomy? Well, I, I, I'm still not clear about the, the questions, but uh, if you would like to share some thoughts on that. I, I suppose um, you really have to look carefully about the OCT. Um, <clears throat> you never know because, um, again, the, the angle, I, I find the angle assessment could be quite variable between different doctors. Mm -hmm. So um, if it's opened, um, I don't see why we're doing the iridotomy. Um, and if it is normal, and be careful about the visual field because the visual field might be, there might be a learning effect if the OCT is normal. Um, well, I, I, I would go for the, but for now, I would go for RNFL and GCIPL, right? Sometimes the OCT RNFL is, is perfectly normal. Then if you look at GCIPL, um, and, and for me, you know, how do you, how do you mean by normal? If it is just um, all the figures in green, I won't call that normal. Look at the, the thickness map, look at the deviation map together. Make sure that you don't miss a defect. Um, and and whether or not any defect uh, or any suspected defect might be matching to, to your your official field. Um, so I would suggest you repeat the official field first uh, and carefully look at the OCT. If the OCT quality is not good, repeat it again. Make sure you include NFL and also the GCIPL before you proceed on to do any intervention. Yes, according to the sub-study, I think uh, from, from just only with this information, I think uh, we should uh, take some time for this patient to be repeated on some I mean, examinations and then, you know, follow up for a few times. And then, uh, but for me, at this moment, I think uh, we can wait for the laser idotomy. I'm not recommending to do that right away, but uh, we have, Somehow we have to follow them for quite some time. I'm not sure. So, so you, yeah. you so Poban, you you think of that we have to repeating some of the clinical examination, right? And uh, for, yeah. to make sure I'm, that I'm 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 quite suspicious about the the visual field. It could yes, it could be, it I could do. Be, yeah. I am, so am I. All right, thank you so much. And then now I think it's time for our next session of the Young Glaucoma Specialist. Thank you, Poman. This is very nice and a wonderful lecture. Well, next I'm going, I'm going to uh, uh, take you to another session of the Y Our Young program. And uh, for the three speakers, is uh, waiting to present their slides and their case sharing. The first speaker I would like to introduce, uh, Dr. Sorry, Sujata Kadambi. She is um, the glaucoma specialist and uh, working as a consultant glaucoma service as a Sankara Nethalaya in Chennai, India. She completed her graduate medical education from St. John's Medical College in Bangalore and was assured the best outgoing student of her batch. She completed her master's in ophthalmology from Alvin Eye Hospital, Madurai, and her fellowship training in glaucoma at Narayana Netralaya, Bangalore, India. She is a fellow of the International Council of Ophthalmology and also a member of the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. She is a part of the Young Ophthalmologist Associate Board of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. She is a recipient 
of the Linus Palme Award by the Swedish government and the Ruby Benick Award for the best clinical research in Sankara Netralaya for the year 2022. She has several publications in peer review journals. Her areas of interest include work on intraocular pressure and imaging in glaucoma. So now everyone, please welcome Dr. Kadambi. reduce treatment success outcomes. Ocular surface disease affects nearly 40 to 60 percent of glaucoma patients. Apart from the symptoms of dryness, burning and foreign body sensation, it has a huge negative impact on the quality of glaucoma care by affecting patient evaluation, quality of diagnostic tests, adherence to medication and surgical manipulation and success. I will take you through a series of cases which illustrate how OSD affects each of these fears, leading to reduced treatment outcomes. Case one is that of a 45 year old male with primary open angle glaucoma on bimetoprost for over three years. Periorbital changes and tight lids make intraocular pressure measurement by Goldman applination tonometer difficult and sometimes inaccurate due to tight lids. Exposure and evaluation of the superior bulbar conjunctival area is also difficult. Ocular surface changes, be it dry eye or meibomian gland dysfunction, can also affect the quality of diagnostic tests like visual fields, OCT, and digital biometry for IOL power calculation. This is a case of a patient with primary open angle glaucoma on dorsalamide timolol combination for over three years slated for a phaco trabeculectomy. Anterior segment exam shows mild corneal staining and a few punctate epithelial erosions. When the patient is taken for digital biometry, there is distortion of the keratometry myers. Since in this case, the ocular surface changes are mild, they improve with the use of lubricants and we are able to procure clear myers. The same observation is made with respect to visual field performance. A 60-year-old male with primary angle closure glaucoma has severe contact dermatitis and poor adherence to medication. This kind of contact dermatitis is generally thought to be produced by carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. But treatment history reveals that the patient is on these medications. So, in this case, it isn't the active drug, but the preservative benzalkonium chloride present in the first medication, which is responsible for his dermatitis. The condition improved when he was shifted to preservative free medication and topical tacrolimus was given for two weeks. Next is a case of a patient with primary angle closure glaucoma on bramonidine timolol combination, dorsalamide, and traboprost. He has advanced field damage in both eyes and high IOP in the right warranting a trabeculectomy. Anterior segment exam shows severe follicular conjunctivitis. So, in this case, bramonidine is identified as the allergen and stop. The patient was put on low-dose topical steroid, fluoromethylone, in tapering doses along with copious lubricants for four weeks. Oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors was given for IOP control till resolution of allergy, after which surgery was performed. Next is the case of severe OSD, drug-induced pseudopemphigoid with cicatrizing changes in the conjunctiva. In this case, all topical IOP lowering agents are stopped. The patient is put on oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors till the surface inflammation subsides with topical steroids and lubricants, following which surgery is planned. OSD can also affect surgical management. Periorbital changes and tight lids make exposure of the surgical site, intraoperative manipulation, postoperative bleb manipulation, massage, needling its slit lamp, and laser suturolysis difficult. Subconjunctival inflammation produced by long term use of anti glaucoma medication can lead to more vascularized blebs and scarring. Thus, 
OSD negatively impacts the quality of glaucoma care by affecting all these aspects and leading to reduced treatment success, making it imperative for the clinician to recognize and treat OSD early. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kadambi. That's very interesting for all cases that you have presented. Uh, by the way, if anyone in the audience has any questions for her, please enter all those questions in the comment sections in your, in, you know, in, in your stream yards. And all the case presenters and mentors will participate in the Q&A session schedule at the end of this webinar. By the way, um, permanent, um, uh, Dr. Kadambi, are, are you still there? Can you hear me? Dr. Kadambi, can you hear me? We've got, I think we've got about uh, five yes. to eight minutes for the, you know, short discussion of this. I can hear you. Yeah, All right. Switch yeah. off. Yeah, I know. Um, <clears throat> All right. Okay. There is. Okay. Well, Pullman, do you have any, any uh, comments on her presentation? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I looked at this, well, it's, it's a very nice presentation. Yes, uh, well Sunny. done. I'm able to hear you. Hello? Hello? She's off here? Hello? Dr. Kudambe, are you there? Can you hear us? All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think she can hear, but it's a bit... Um, a slow for no her problem. to receive the audio. Yeah. I think we yeah. can just continue the discussion. Yeah. Right. All right. Uh, very nice presentation. And I would just like to ask uh, about, <clears throat> you know, tight fits and, and surgery. Do you have any tips to share? Um, how would you how you would like to do the surgery with the tight lids? I mean, it's, it's quite challenging to not just junior doctors, but um, many of us. So, uh, <laughs> See, see, you know, do you, do you, apart from the preparation, um, is there any way you can encounter these tight lids? All right. Uh, maybe there are some kind of, you know, uh, if for, I hear the uh, question uh, right, uh, how different right, is I'll turn the question out. So, um, how different is the surgery in patients with tight lids? Yeah, I mean, do you have any tips? To share with us do you have any tips to share with us how you would uh, if say you have to do a trypagolectomy yes. for patients uh, with tight lips um is there any way you can you can overcome the problems uh the in terms yes i think in terms of uh, patients with tight lids and deep set eyes it is the surgical exposure and the intraoperative manipulation which is difficult you yeah. use of the ONG labum and speculum would provide a better exposure if we are planning only a trabeculectomy or only a glaucoma surgery. Even use of a clear corneal traction would help to provide better exposure. Another important issue we face is if in case of a phaco trabeculectomy is a lot of pooling of the irrigating fluid when we are doing the FACO. So if there is a scrub assistant who helps draw the irrigating fluid and discards, uh, so that will help prevent the pooling. Shallow anterior chamber, which we encounter very commonly in these uh, glaucomatous patients, it's hard to do the rexis. So probably a three bend in the cystitome, which helps yep. in greater excursion of the cystitome as we are going for our intraoperative manipulation is a little easier. And most of these cases we do under peribulbar block overcome. A lot of the block can get to that. It kind of spreads out, can reduce the tightness of the lids. All right. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, and uh, from uh, other questions, um, but Pullman, if you th th do, you have any comments on this uh, with in, in the eye, in the tight eyelid patients, 
because for me, I think uh, if we if the if the FACO is an elective case, and uh, perhaps just like you know we have to, ch I would change the regimen into something else that do not cause the PAPS because PAPS itself, uh, we already recognize that it can be reversible, but mm. it would take time about two or three months. Um, so I think we may get a, a better. Uh, surface or the better ocular structures that, that can allow us to do some more easy FAGO. Uh, I don't know, but but it uh, depends on the, the situations. But uh, do you have any insights on this? Um, I, I I sort of get away from a lot of those problems. I, I mean, I want, I wanted to very difficult one where I mm -hmm. really have major difficulty trying to to expose the the conch. On the, on the mm -hmm. spirits. So I, I was so tempting just to do a cancotomy. I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, because nowadays I do my triplectomy, I start from the supranasal. Right. Um, right. Really posterior. Supranasal and so that sort of get, get myself away from the problem. This is the supranasal. And yep. um, I tend to do the, um, the traction suture all the way um, as, as much as I could. So that I can afford the lies completely sort of um, down to, to the super to the infra temporal direction in order to okay. expose the nasal direction. And yes. um and um one of the problem I, I wouldn't be able to show it here, but one of the one of the problem with the traction suture is that uh, if you just track the uh, traction on um with with the with these with one speculum uh, it's very, it's very difficult because it would just go back. So you need, you need a system to actually pull the the whole um, the whole traction and and, and 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 sort of make the exposure properly. A special speculum they can use. I, I don't do that because I, I use I use a set of different techniques of doing the traction suture. And let me see what I can find that, that picture here. Um, before, before, and and so you know, let's let's carry on talk about something else. So I try to find their photos if I can. Um, let's see where I can find it. But um, I might not be able to do that. <laughs> All right, anyway, thank you, and then thank you, uh, Doctor uh, Kadambi, for for this presentation because you showed us that um, glaucoma medication has somehow their own various as aspect on the negative. Uh, aspect on the you know thank the you. surgical interventions right thank you and uh, so we can go on with the next speaker all right okay uh, thank you okay. for uh, if, I share, um, yes. if I share the slide um, so sorry about that it's, it's, this is um... you can click on present and then share screen instead yeah I'm trying to work that out Sorry to disrupt the uh, the. No but I, so it could be quite interesting to share. Yes, um, please do. window. There we go. So this is how I do my <clears throat> traction suture. You see that I used to um, forcep. Yes. So I traction suture. Um, you can see the traction suture on the eye. And yes, yes. you can see that I am using two forceps. The first one is a curved forcep that you just tight on the draping. That mm -hmm. works as a pull. Mm -hmm. And I I pull the this I pull this the the um the vicro uh, six six zero nicro with yes. another uh, with another forcep like so. So I rest mm -hmm. the stitch on 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 this pulley system. Yes. Yeah. And that that yeah. really helps you to really move the book like down. Um, you said if you if you tight if you sort of try to try to fix the traction switcher on the draping, the draping would just come along. Yes. So it won't help. yes, agree. This, this yes, is my agree. trick. Yes, agree. So, but uh, actually, you've got just kind of the one cornea suture. Um, sorry, uh, one cornea stay suture, one traction, and then use. Uh, two forceps to help on that, right? Yeah, I, um, I use so so the the system goes with uh, a corneal traction suture, yes. and then on the other hand, you have the you have the artery forceps just just to yes. supposed to be tightening on the drape. But instead of tightening on the drape, 
I use a curved forcep, a curved artery forcep, to 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 fix on the draping so that it works like a pulley system. Right. Okay. So it it is the suture rests on the curved forcep instead of actually being being fixed on on the on the draping. Okay. This is actually free. You can you can take this out. You can take this out and, and become free again. This one this one is just there as a pulley system. Yep. So it looks in the, you know in good practice. If you if if, if anyone uh, in the audience uh, you know you can learn from this and uh, adapt to yourself to your surgical practice uh, that uh, you in, in in what way that you could do. All right, thank you, Foreman. That's excellent. And, and next, we are moving on with uh, Dr. Ong. And now I'm going to introduce him, the second case presenter. He's born and raised in Kuala Lumpur. Hong Ki Ong graduated with a degree in medicine from the University of Science Malaysia. He completed his ophthalmology specialist training and a master of medicine in ophthalmology at the University of Sans Malaysia in 2015. He completed his glaucoma fellowship at the Royal Perth Hospital in Western Australia. He received a certi uh, sorry, the certificate of completion for fellowship training in glaucoma from the Malaysian Ministry of Health and currently working as a glaucoma surgeon in Raja Pamasuri Bainan Hospital in Ipoh, Malaysia. Dr. Ong is particularly interested in complex glaucoma surgery and using his new technology in the glaucoma patient's management. And now, please proceed uh, your presentation, Dr. Ong. Hi, Dr. Ng, can, can we uh, have your video turned on and also unmute? Thank you. Okay, yeah, we can see you now. Can you see you now? Yes, now we can yeah. see the full slide. All right, okay. Then thank you very much, Prof. Sunny, for the kind introductions. A very good evening, everyone. My name is Hong Ki from Ipoh, Malaysia. And I, first of all, I would like to thank the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society uh, for allowing me for, to speak here and to share with you all a case of mine uh, on the impact of the ocular surface disorder and the membrane gland dysfunctions that increased risk of the post-op complications. And I do not have any conflict of interest to declare pertaining to these presentations. Well, I have a 48 years old gentleman who have a diabetic mellitus, who has a fair, quite fair control, active smoker, no family history of glaucoma, no fall, no trauma, and on steroids. During his first presentations to me, it's noted that vision acuity was pretty okay, 6'18 and 6'9, left eye was 6'12, and two segments was normal, with mouth catcher on the right eye, pseudo fake it for the left eye. Gonoscopy will open for all quadrants in both the eyes and presenting IOP was 20 on the right, 24 on the left, with the posterior segment show the advanced glaucometer cuppings. Uh, right is cut this ratio of 0.9, on the left is pale list with almost fully cupped. This is the uh, visual field of the patients which show the tunnel vision bilateral eyes, left eye worse than the right eye, with the 10 2 over the left eye show a very depressed uh, field inferior half with the macular splits. So he was diagnosed with the bilateral eye advanced uh, primary open angle glaucoma, left eye worse than right eye, the left eye macular split and started on with the uh, gut lateral pros uh, or knife for both the eyes. Over time, his IOP was uncontrolled and needed the addition of anti-glaucoma medications until four classes. And despite that, his uh, IOP, the latest one was 16 on the right and the left eye was 25. Hence, it will that left eye was uncontrolled eye therapy. I discussed with the patients the options of the left eye glaucoma surgery. Now, I would like to ask the audience and the matter as well that what will you choose for this patient? Whether you want to choose for trabeculectomy, glaucoma drainage device, blood based MIGS, cyclophotogogulation, or other options. I mean, the audience will, uh, can, can put it, your, your options into the comments so that we can have a pull and survey and before I proceed to the next stage of the presentation. All right, we've got about, you know, uh, 10 seconds for you. 
for all the audiences, if you have any comments on this or, for, or you have the answer in your mind and you'd like to share with us, please uh, go on with in the comments box. At this moment, at this moment, no, not yet. Anyone would like to share your thought? Yes. All right, one. And uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm cutting now to save the yeah. time. All right, just one. Uh, the audience come with a A, Trebek Collectomy. All right, thanks, thanks, bro. So as the left eye is an advanced uh, primary open in glaucoma with macular splits, I think of the high risk of the white eye syndrome, has discussed with the patients uh, to the options of the black base MIGS, and the patient agree upon, and has I decided to do a, a pressure flow implant for these patients. During the pre-op assessments, the patient complained of discomfort and some foreign body sensations, and the right assessment noted that there's some right eye may be my cappings with the congenital smile injected with papillae and the tears break up time of five seconds. And it's almost similar on the left eye. Otherwise, IOP was 14 on the right, left eye was 20. And this is the picture. It's slightly similar, but I don't have the accept patient's picture, but it's almost similar as this one. And at this moment, there's the diagnosis of the both eye MGD with the ocular surface disorder and dry eye disease as well as allergic components. So what would you do? I mean, it's decided to, to plan for this patient for the filtration surgery. So I will try to, uh, to treat this uh, MGD and the ocular surface disorder prior to that. And I would like to ask the audience as well, what is your options for this? What, is your, what will you do if let's say you have these patients in your practice? I think you have the multiple choices. Uh, can can the, just only one best choice or multiple no, choices? No, you can just can choose the multiple choices. You can just type by A, B, C, D, E, F. Yeah. Yes, please. For the audience, all right. Not yet. Um, appearing. All right. One start with all of them if possible. Yeah, it's just possible, Prophet. It's all of them. Yeah, all right, okay. Um, I'm cutting okay. now. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, okay. So what right. did you so so because this patient is, is in the public health system, so I, I don't have the preservative uh, anti medications in my practice. And or as the solomite was the patients have a history of started before and was not tolerant to it. So I, I gave the B, C, D, and E for this patients. And his MGD and the uh, dry eye disease improved after two months and proceeded to do a left uh, with a left eye pressure flow implant with a mitomycin C of 0.04%, and it was uneventful. And the post uh, pressure flows reveals patient responded uh, to the pressure flow, and the left eye IOB came down immediate post operatively to single digits. He was prescribed with topical desmetasone and antibiotic. However, his IOB climbed up back again about a month after the surgery, and we noted that there is a localized moderate high blood content wise small injected with vascularization, but DD and MGD was kind of improved, and I uh, injected this patient with three times of five FU injections. Despite that, after the third injection, his IOB escalated further up to 26, hence stop and retain what a strategy for these patients. What should I do next? Whether I continue to give the 5 FG injections? Should I do a needling with 5 FG injection? Do open revision or start back with the anti glaucoma medications? Yep, so the audience will have a choice as well to, to maybe share your thoughts. Which one is your options? Hello, Prof. Just one uh, the, with the with the A. Continue to give the five FG injections also with some with C. All open right. revision. Open revision. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Prof. E as well. Yep. Different. Different answers. Opinion. All right. Yep. A B C. So I. 
decided to in view of the localized blab and implanted conch and despite the three times or five FG injections and IOP is still escalated further so I decided to go in for the needling for this gentleman which uh, intraoperatively during needling there was some scarring tissue plus plus uh, but still able to establish black flows post needling I ended up with a five FG injection for these patients post needling IOP dropped to single digit back at seven uh, immediate post ops and about a week post needling, he came back with a symptomatic overfiltration and IOP dropped to three. No leaking uh, was observed, and we had to went into AC reform with uh, viscous elastic. Subsequently, IOP built up again and which improved. And somehow the patient was uh, kind of didn't come back for such a reveal. And IOP was escalating further, and until recently, it showed up to 26 millimeter mercury again. On examination, it's localized and encapsulated black now with the conjunctiva is injected with vascularizations and the symptoms and signs of the dry eye and the MGD is coming back. On further uh, history, the patient is still smoking and he's still taking his the uh, gut dismetasone. Well, I would like to ask the audience the last questions of my presentation. What is the next step? Whether will you go for second needling or 5FU? Or we do open revisions, or we start back with topical anti glaucoma, or we try to re establish back with five FU injections. Yes, anyone would like to give some answer? A, B, C, D after the next step. Second needling, open revision, start back topical, five FU. Yes, now with uh, I'm, I'm cutting right now. Five, four, three, two, one. There are two options here from the audience A and B. And the all right, thanks, thanks, Prof. And also C uh, as well. <laughs> I'll just summarize the case in case of so this is old male diabetic chronic smoker. Both eye advanced a POAG left eye more than right eye with MGD and dry eye disease, left eye control underwent uneventful pressure flow. Postoperatively near three injection with five FU and underwent left eye needling. Subsequently, however, complicated with symptomatic hypotony and needed AC reformation. Currently, the left eye, I will be increasing trend with encapsulated blood. So I decided to go in for a second needling with five FU. At the same time, uh, continue with the medication of the artificial tear preservative free and tisamitasone. As the patient continue with late hygiene and warm compressions, and can to start with the cyclosporins and advise the patient to stop smoking. So uh, for the surgical options, planning to go in for a second needling with 5FU. If in case there is fail, then I will, might go in for the open revision for these patients. And just a little bit on discussion that tetracycline and acetromycin may have the anti-inflammatory effect in the treatment of MGD. However, the long-term effect is still unclear as it might develop antibiotic resistance. Uh, some may suggest the supplementary essential fatty acids of omega-3 FA. Uh, initial paper may suggest the greater improvement in the tear spray cup time and schema test, but the most recent study comparing the 12 months daily supplement showed that there's no differences in outcome. Smoking is quite debatable. Some may say that it's associated with dry eyes. Some may say it's not, but smoke, smokers have demonstrated they have higher a uh, lower success rate of one year after trabeculectomy, as well as higher requirement for blood-related interventions. And with that, I invite the mentors and to give your comments and for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ong. It's a nice presentation. And uh, yeah, the piece of flow is one of our macros that I think uh, in many regions that uh, we have not had it. Yes, we have a few, ex we have some experiences with them. And uh, anyway, if anyone has further comments on the Dr. Ong presentation, we will keep it at the end of the session. So now I think we have limited time for, you know, for the discussion. But anyway, uh, um, Paulman, well, do you have any comments on, the, on this case? Yeah. Um, well, uh, well, well, well done, by the way. I, I think it's a very nice presentation and it, it shows um, some of the problems that we face with micro shunt. Um, I, I personally, I'm not, I'm not, of course, I, I have used some micro shunt, but I, I won't call myself an expert in that field. Um, but uh, I think for needling, it's actually quite difficult, do you not think? 
um, Dr. Ng? Uh, surprisingly, I, I have done about 20 plus. I have three patients who needed needling so far. Yeah. And it's quite difficult because this covering by the clinic itself, it, uh, it cannot visualize it clearly. So sometimes I have to use my skin lens to delineate it. When you cut it off, it's, it's initially thought it's kind of a blind procedure. You're not really sure whether it's above and below the pressure flow. But surprisingly, the outcome is quite amazing, yeah. I would say, for the past three patients I have. Yeah, it's just that sometimes we had to manage uh, post operative one month, two months back, whereby it start to build up again like, the scarring tissue with IOP stuff to climb back again. And then that I think that would be the challenge, especially those patients who have this uh, MGD and DEDI. Yeah, you're quite right. Um, I, I find the needling quite quite tough for micro shunts, and um, um, you know, I I would I I think I think the first time doing the needling is quite is quite. Um, it's quite a good idea to, to at least try once for the needling. But then, you know, I think it depends on the next step you want it to do, because if if you believe the scarring is a little bit too much, then uh, once you open up, you, you realize that how how, how mm. active the scarring could be in, in, in the region. Um, uh, it's surprisingly um, uh, fibrotic uh, sometimes. So, um, well, I don't know uh, if the needling works, then you know you may as well go ahead again. But um, it really depends. If you if you think that the, the the scarring is getting a bit too much, then perhaps opening it up is might not be a bad option. Well, I, I, I agree with Perman. Is uh, for the migration itself, uh, the needling is a little bit more difficult than the trabeculectomy because uh, the blood usually go posterior. And uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, how how long have you followed up these patients uh, since the first operation? Because I didn't see the timeline, so I'm just wondering, and how how long did you have put the patients on the the topical steroid after after the surgery? Uh, I would say it's about uh, four months. Probably yes. it's a tapering dose. Yeah, it depends on yes. how 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 injected is conjunctival. Yep. Yes. In my practice, right. usually I'll start with the two hourly steroids, quite intensive. Right. They bring okay. down at least maybe for about one month. Before mm -hmm. I they bring down depends on the how how I feel that the the conjunctival how it is injected or not. With the Prisoflor itself, and somehow with the sand itself as well, I think uh, for me, I'm not sure for, for the other comments, but I think uh, we might see some kind of that we call the hypertensive phase as well. I'm not sure about it, but uh, usually with the blep, uh, I, I observe that in some cases they have the very tight and the very vascularized, uh, the highly vascularized, and uh, the eyepiece comes up, and then when we start doing something like treating like a, you know in the gdd hypertensive phase once and then the blood comes more quiet and uh seems and and later on the um i mean the the, the pressure itself comes down a little bit so i think uh, i'm not sure i'm I, I have not much a bunch of uh you know the patients with the pressure flow or the micro stand but yes we've got a Yes, not a few, but uh, quite some of them. And I, I try to observe this as well. But um, yeah, needling is quite difficult for that. Yeah. All right. Okay. But uh, I mean, it's a good it's a good experience too. Well, all right. I think uh, because we are behind, we are behind of the schedule. So uh, thank you, Dr. Ong. And uh, because we can keep up uh, with the questions later at the Q&A session. And that, uh, at this moment, may I go to the next speaker? Thank, thank you. you. And next speaker um, from the Philippines, I will now introduce him. And, uh, for he, he will be the third or the final case presenter. Dr. Jedraya Jr. obtained his medical degree and master's degree in business administration as well. That's, that's pretty good. And uh, at the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health, he completed both his residency and fellowship training at the Central Ophthalmological Jose Rizal at the Philippine General Hospital. He is currently a glaucoma specialist practicing at Davao City, where he established the premier eye and laser center. 
He is a consultant at Davao Doctors Hospital and trains ophthalmology residents at the Southern Philippine Medical Center. He is also a member of the Philippine Glaucoma Society and helps train residents throughout the country. So now, please welcome Dr. Jet on his presentation. Thank you, Professor, for that kind introduction. So let me just share my slide. Okay. All right. So good evening, everyone. Um, this is a relatively straightforward case that showcases the effect of preservative free medications on surgical outcomes. So these are my disclosures. Now, just a brief introduction as to why I chose this case. Whenever we talk about preservative free medications, the discussion usually centers on ocular signs and symptoms, and rightly so because there are so many adverse effects that can decrease the patient's quality of life. We should keep in mind, however, that the negative effects of preservatives go beyond the ocular surface. Preservatives also cause apoptosis of trabecular meshwork cells, damaging the trabecular outflow pathway, leading to incre increased pressures over time. And even when a patient undergoes filtering surgery, chronic exposure to preservatives results in highly inflamed eye and increases the risk of surgical failure. So the, uh, this finding is best illustrated by the findings of the PESO study, which showed that there's earlier bleb failure when there is greater preoperative exposure to preservatives. It showed that the number of medications isn't the issue. It's, it was a total amount of preservatives being delivered with each drop. So, this has a huge implication. When we are putting patients on maximum tolerated medical therapy, trying to eke out every last IOP reduction just before subjecting the patient to filtering surgery, we should remember to do so in a manner that maximizes outcomes of future interventions. So this is a simple case that illustrates this concept. Our patient is an 80-year-old diabetic male who was being managed for chronic glaucoma. 10 years prior to consultation, he noted gradual progressive blurring of vision in both eyes, which did not resolve despite cataract surgery. At the time, he was being managed by a doctor outside of the city where I practice. And when he moved to the city, his new ophthalmologist referred him for further management. At the time of consultation, he was on one fixed combination medication on the right eye and two fixed combination medications for his left eye. And both eyes were maintained on artificial tears which relieved the occasional ocular discomfort. Physical examination showed vision of 2060 on the right and 2070 on the left. Intraocular pressures were 14 and 27. The left eye showed significantly more hyperemia than the right. And the left eye, uh, or his refraction, revealed pseudophagic monovision with the poorer eye being targeted for a near. And this, of course, isn't ideal in advanced glaucoma cases. This is because uh, permanent vi visual field defects can prevent one or both eyes from functioning independently at an adequate level to support monovision. Now, both eyes showed no signs of diabetic retinopathy at the time of examination. Fortunately, he already had some diagnostics done. His OCT revealed um, severe cupping in averaged sized discs with sectoral retinal nerve fiber layer thinning. Macular ganglion cell complex scan showed a generally thinned out GCC layer in both eyes, falling below the first percentile compared to the normative database. Octopus perimetry with G program test using a dynamic strategy showed moderate field depression with superior arc rate and central secocentral scotomas in the right eye. The left eye showed severe generalized field defects that are more pronounced superiorly if we look at the raw data. And this correlates well with the inferior RNFL thinning seen on OCT. Central paracentral scotomas are also seen. Examination of the central 10 degrees shows threatened fixation in both eyes. So the assessment for this case was advanced primary open angle glaucoma due to the bilateral presentation of the disease open angles, intraocular pressures despite medical therapy, as well as the structural and functional evidence of advanced optic nerve damage. 
He advised the patient regarding his options, including the importance of doing a trabeculectomy. However, the patient opted to try SLT first. He was later shifted to preservative-free medications. This is the right eye. The first picture is on regular fixed-dose combination bimatoprost plus stimulol. And the second picture was taken four months after the patient was uh, shifted to preservative-free tafloprost with timolol. And we can note that there is decreased hyperemia. This is likely from a combination of switching away from a molecule that is known to cause more hyperemia and from decreasing the overall preservative load. Now, this is the left eye. The first photo was the patient on the first visit. Here we see a hyperemic conjunctiva, and this is the type of eye that you know will have a tendency to bleed when you do trabeculectomy. The photo in the middle was taken preoperatively four months after the patient had been shifted to preservative-free medications. And the photo on the bottom right was taken three months following surgery, showing the diffuse, low-rise, relatively healthy-looking bleb after the sutures had been released. And the extent of the bleb is dem demarcated by the uh, dashed line. So the APGC has the following definitions for maximum tolerated medical therapy. And the ideal definition focuses on achieving maximum IOP reduction with the least number of medications. Now, perhaps we can still improve on this definition. As better drugs become available, it is no longer an issue of maximum medications while straddling what the patient can tolerate. Preservative feed drugs can help us achieve the necessary IOP reduction while maintaining a good quality of life. So to end this presentation, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite everyone in the audience to come to the Philippines for the upcoming Asia-Pacific Locomo Congress that's happening on May 24 to 26 next year. We already have a great lineup of speakers, and I'm sure you're going to love all the discussions. And for those who would like to submit their abstracts, ABGC is accepting submissions until December 1. When you come, I suggest you extend your stay and visit the different islands. We have so much to offer, and I'm sure you'll all have a good time. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rayo. It's, uh, again, it's an interesting um slides and presentations of how we manage the patient's video OSD. And uh, we come with a, we, we will come across with a short uh, discussion on this case. It's, but for if anyone in the audience has uh, some kind of uh, questions, we will keep it at the end of the session at the Q&A. Well, um, Hoban, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, it seems to be a straightforward case, but it's not. Um, you know, with, with all the, um, uh, it could be quite tricky when, you know, and and it could be quite tricky that one can just go straight in and without with just ignoring all the ocular surface disease and just, just oh, oh, patient replies, just go ahead and you make a big mess out of it. Sometimes I did that in the past and, you know, fine, you know, sometimes I've managed to get away from managing the OSD at all. Um, uh, well done with the um, with the pre-op management. I think I think those are those could be quite critical sometimes. Um, if, if, you know, it's very tempting just to operate on the red eye, um, and um, it's, it's good that you got the chance to, to be able to taper OST down before you do the operation. And there's a very nice breath, very nice breath there. Even though it's a little bit injected, but you know, as long as it works, I think it's all fine. So well done. So I, I'm just wondering, uh, Dr. Chat, do you, do you do that sort of regularly to your patients, or um, or um, sometimes you, you sort of um, do, you, do you have any particular standard that or any threshold that you will start um, sort of extensive OST management before you do that? Well, um, it really depends on the presentation of the patient on the initial consultation. If the patient comes to me with a really high intraocular pressure, uh, something that I don't think medica topical medications can really control. So we don't really have the benefit of time for cases such as that. So of course, we'll try to uh, give the patient uh, Diamox uh, just for the uh, 
IOP reduction, uh, which tends to be better than the topical medications. And then uh, for those cases, uh, may, if the eye is really inflamed, maybe we can also give steroids just to bring the inflammation down, just to maximize the success and give the anti-metabolites during surgery and really hope for the best. But in cases where, uh, in cases such as this one, where there was still a bit of time, uh, the pressure wasn't that elevated, we could still control it with uh, other treatment modalities. I do try to, uh, I do try to shift the patients to preservative-free medications just to maximize the uh, chances of success. So yeah, I, I do that too. Yeah, I do, that too. Mm -hmm. do, do you guys do uh, Michael Powers before before proceeding? You know, if the pressure is not very well controlled, you need a trachectomy, but then it's so red that you feel like you know perhaps trachectomy will fail. So some some surgeons in my region they, they do they do Michael Powers. I personally don't. So oh. do you, mm -hmm. would you consider that Michael Powers? Give a few moments, and then later on you do a trachectomy. Well, I'll be honest, um, I don't have access to the technology where I practice, so it's not an option for me right now. But I'm, I'm actually curious as, as to the experience of other surgeons. Um, do do you or the other presenters do it? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's an interesting, uh, I think it's interesting question. So I think we have, uh, uh, you know, other alternatives just like Michael Post, yes. And uh, if uh, we think um, perhaps it's going to be scar and uh, our trip, the best surgery would be felt, I think uh, another that we have is the ECP or the endoscopic cycle photocoagulation. Because in your cases, they are pseudo fake guys. And uh, so we can approach them from that. And uh, we don't, at this moment, we don't need to uh, leave the patients until, you know, I mean, um, uh, or leave all those alternatives to as the last resort of the treatment because in eyes, we can do it uh, without much worries about their serious complications, just like, uh, you know, hypogeny or the thysis. Yeah. Hi. And uh, yeah, oh, yeah, just I, I have one question, Dr. Royal. Um, because you, you, this is a case with the OSD, but if you, uh, you know, we explore that the patient has the OSD before we start with the medications, would you go with the laser rather than the medication, or would you go for the surgery rather than I mean, earlier intervention rather than you know, chronic? medications well if there are signs of um toxicity from all the drugs that we're giving whether it's uh you know ocular surface disease or otherwise i do try to place the patient on a medication holiday so what professor paul mentioned uh, mentioned at the start of the uh of this session uh, it's actually a good idea to uh, put the patient on diamox stop all the medications just keep the pressure down, give the patient steroids, and try to bring the overall inflammation uh, in the eye down to something that is more comfortable for the patient and will be easier for us to manage when the time comes to do uh, further interventions. For um, Since you asked about um, uh, micropulse laser, um, rather than doing micropulse, I do... Uh, Sometimes when uh, the uh, opportunity presents itself, for example, for patients who will be undergoing FACO, I do uh, an eye stent or maybe a Kahook dual blade surgery. So I think this is also um, a space where MIGs can play a role for uh, patients with, with, who are prone to ocular surface disease. We can bring down the medication requirement also with minimally invasive glaucoma procedures, particularly canal-based procedures. Yeah. Yes, uh, for the POHA, the, the canal the canal -based surgery can be an option. But in my country, I don't I don't have that. I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, then. So I think uh, it's now come to the Q&A session right now. So I think we can have all of the, our, uh, you know, speakers on the screen as well. So um, I'm going to see whether they have any questions from the audience. At this moment, that is none. But if any audience would like to, um, you know, uh, have some questions, please share your question on the comments box, please. All right. Okay. Um, we are waiting for that. But uh, for me, oh, let me go to Dr. Kadambi, please. Um, I have some uh, uh, questions about, you know, for your your case number five that uh, has a contact with the sun that and you yeah, know no no with the pemphic oil one pseudo pemphic oil one and you stop all those uh, medications um i i would like yes. to uh, ask you whether if you have to re-challenge the medication again uh what would your first that you think that you should start with because at that time we don't know exactly uh, what medication would be the, you know, the major cause of those pemphigoid reactions? And uh, for yourself, uh, what would you do? Would you give us some tips on that? Uh, it would depend on what is... Uh, we would first stop all the topical IOP lowering agents and give oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors as well as some mm -hmm. low dose topical steroids till the surface inflammation subsides. And then, mm -hmm. then after removing or washing out the oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, look at what is the IOP as well as what is the disc and visual field damage so that we kind of have an idea what is the IOP we need to target. Based on that, something uh, in the low teens, uh, then probably surgery is the option. If it's advanced field loss and, and we need to have a low target, then probably surgical option is preferred. But if it's something okay. like it's only mild glaucoma and uh, mm -hmm. we could have something high teens or something, probably first choose a preservative free option of the medications. Mm -hmm. Here we have mm -hmm. access to preservative free prostaglandin analogs as well as or uh, as well as uh, alpha agonist and beta blocker combinations. If it is an open angle, then we probably, but if it's very advanced, this damage, then surgical option is preferred. All right. Okay. Um, anyone in the panel, uh, will you share some of your thoughts about that? All right. Okay. With the case number five, with the pemphigor reaction, and uh, um, I'm not sure how many drops that uh, the patient had been on, but uh, Dr. Uh, Tedambi just stopped all those medications and then uh, tried to uh, refresh the surface, and then she might go on with the uh, surgical interventions. And uh, I think uh, yeah, might be we, we would go with that and, uh, you know, make some kind of the mid holidays going on with the systemic CAI. And uh, uh, for your, and uh, I, I think uh, for, for myself, uh, for the Pemphigoy, um, I'm not sure, do you have any, you, you yourself in the panel, do you have any experience with that? And uh, with medication that you think um, uh, should be the major cause so we can have these tips to our audience about that? Mm. I'm afraid I don't, <clears throat> I don't, I don't, I don't usually, you know, I don't. I don't usually encounter that. The mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have no comments. It's quite All quite right. tough, really. Okay. All right. Others. All right. Okay. This kind well, of uh, I don't change. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. This kind of psychiatric changes can occur when the patient is on multiple medications, uh, and these yeah. are. Uh, uh, basically, because it's a tertiary care center, we see patients who have been started on multiple medications who have been using it for a very long time when they present to us. So uh, these are all already most of them are already cases of advanced glaucoma on multiple medications. So in this mm -hmm. case, we cannot. Uh, it's not exactly just allergy to one medication, but it's long-term mm -hmm. surface changes which have been produced. 
most of these changes mm -hmm. are irreversible in terms of the simblephron, but we just wait for a little of the inflammation on the bulba conjunctivitis to uh, subside with the topical steroids. So, and then we, if the bulba conjunctiva is a little low key, then we can even plan a trabeculectomy. Of course, in all these cases, scarring and need for uh, repeat needling procedures, all that is more common. All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, any other comments? All right. Let me share uh, my questions to Dr. Ong. And again, as you just mentioned, you you you, you in, in your questions about the uh, you know um, what next would you do and uh, for the surgical intervention, and uh, yes, of course, your patient has an OSD, and you select the plissiflor or the microstent. I'm just wondering, uh, in this is your, I mean, uh, for the if you, what what you consider plissiflor rather than the trabeculectomy. In, in right. your case. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, in this case, it's because that uh, in real that the patient has a very advanced glaucoma with the almost fully cupped. And also yes. that the visual field show is there is a macular split with high risk of the wipeout. Usually in my practice, I will explain to the patient and give the patient options. I mean, if this MIGS is like for some pressure flow, is able to be have a better safety profile and at the same time can bring the low uh, IOP to a lower level then uh, I think it's a good option that we can uh, offer to the patients. So this is my mind practice. So that's why I will discuss with the patients Then patients feel that uh, he is more keen to the lower risk. That's why we decided for the present flow for this patient. All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, we've got another question from the audience now. And uh, the question is, um, is there a role in steroid depot? subconjunctival injection for blood based glaucoma surgery. Well then, Holman, would you like to share some thoughts on this? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Um, go ahead, please. No, no, it's yeah. okay. The professor said it's okay. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't I don't use subconch um, injection really or the I, I think I tried a few cases but I don't, didn't feel like it sort of works so well. Um, in fact, talking about the inflammation, I think I think um, <clears throat> I think Tina Wong actually make a very interesting publication. Is um, is within this year's Journal of Glaucoma? It's about uh, using oral NSAID um, or after tracheotomy, and so the the outcome could be quite good. I mean, the theory behind is um, basically after tracheotomy is is pretty much like escharitis. And so, you know, by giving oral uh, uh, NSAID, it, it could it could really help, and and it does work in some white patients when when you you can see that deep inflammation going on, um, and you know, early postoperative, you give some oral NSAID as if treating the scleritis, actually could help. But subconjunctival um, injection of steroid, I'm afraid I I don't I don't really have um, a major preference. With that, I know some surgeon does it, but I personally don't do that. Okay, all right. And, and uh, Doctor Ong, would you like to share some <clears throat> comments? Uh, my my practice is different from Professor Chan. I usually I'll do give on my regular basis for all my uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. And uh, Doctor Rayo, I do get, give it regularly as well for all my glaucoma surgeries. The the depot. Yes. Um, the, so, the, the steroid subconsh depot? Uh, right after trabeculectomy, I, I do a mitomycin injection. And then at the bottom, uh, at the inferior conjunctiva, I do a steroid depot right after trab. All right. And, and, and what and, and uh, what concentration or what type of the steroids that you, uh, that you use? So we use a 40 milligram um, triamcinolone. So I usually give a 0 0.2 dose. 0.2 okay. ml. Okay, did you do you use the same thing? Uh, I use a subconscient of the gentle text of text rather than all right. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's just uh, so the dexamethasone just uh, will have a short time, um, sorry, a half a short half life, 
uh, than the, you know, the GA. And uh, yeah, here we go. We've got Dr. Kadambi. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? For the subconjunctival steroid uh, after? No, uh, we don't use any depot preparation. All right, okay. All right, no, so you can see that. Oh. preparation post uh, glaucoma surgery. All right, thank you. Because uh, you can see that are uh, some kind of, you know, the different opinions on that. And yeah, yeah, it uh, somehow it depends on the experiences. Well, then, uh, so any others? No, not at the moment. So uh, for Dr. Royal, I think I thought you should. Okay, so you talk about, uh, you know, the. Uh, the SLT, right? And uh, do you use the, for, for yourself, do you use SLT, you know, compared to the medications? Um, do you change your, your paradigm in using the laser as a first uh, treatment to your POAG patients? Uh, I definitely have. Um, ever since the light trial results came out, I've started using it as first line intervention. And uh, so far, my results have been similar to uh, what has been published. There's a, a small fraction of patients who don't really respond to SLT. So, and there are some patients who will require retreat, retreatment right after. So that's something that I've observed. Uh, yeah, it's very rare where when I offer SLT as something, you know, as an add-on to a patient who has already had so many medications. So this particular case was uh, rather curious for me because it did work uh, somewhat for a short period of time. Uh, so yeah, but uh, it's not something I would often do. I'm not sure with the other, uh, uh, other members of the panel, but yes, I do use it as first-line intervention. Why, well, Perman? Yeah, I'm... <clears throat> I, I, I would tell them, you know, look, this is the, the new study. Um, this is the new trend. You don't have to follow it, but um, it, it, it could be quite nice. You know, if you're only on one medications, we have the options of preservative free. Alternatively, you, you're traveling a lot. Yes. Uh, you know, why don't you go for SLT? Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, there might be a smaller chance that you will have future surgery, uh, according to the study. Um, and also um, a high chance for you to, to be medication free uh, for quite some time uh, because you still got so many so many years to live on. So you know I tend to tell them what happened and then they choose because sometimes right. they're quite reluctant about you know sipping their eye in, in, in the very first visit. And so um, <clears throat> I tell to I tend to just let them choose. But yeah, I, 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 I I, I, but I have to be very, to be honest, I, I would be quite in, quite selective about the, the, the patient's um, uh, selections. Um, yes. I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful about normal tension glaucoma having an effect by SLT. I mean, it works sometimes, but you never know. But for those, you know, low 20s uh, or mid 20s, I would go for SLT. Yes. Okay. And Dr. Ong and Dr. Kadambi, do you have? Any suggestion? Or no, I, to, I totally agree with Professor Chan and Dr. Ryo about the thoughts of this. Yes. It's just that I don't have I the would... facilities in my center. Yeah. Yes. And Dr. Kadambi? I, I agree too. I would consider it in cases with ocular hypertensive as well as I would consider it in cases with ocular hypertension and my glaucoma open angle cases, the diagnosis of glaucoma and kind of understand the disease, so we cannot have them spend more for a laser. Yeah. But uh, yeah. with a, a few visits, when we be develop a better explain to them that SLT can offer, of course, the uh, effect wanes over with time, but if we can, when affordability is not an issue and you are able to communicate with the patient that it can keep them drop free for a certain period of time, then in cases with OHT and mild glaucoma, open angle cases, I would definitely consider SLT. All right, thank you. All right, I think I'll be uh, running out of time. 
And uh, because today we have talked a lot, and uh, thank you, P P Professor Chen, for mentioning, for sharing with us about the OSD in glaucoma patients, and uh, for all of the three presenters for all the cases, interesting cases, and your, you know, how to manage your patient, particularly with the, uh, you know, patients with the OSD, and you can see that we have the different kinds of uh, uh, treatment options. And uh, so this is the art, you know, this is the art of the glaucoma treatment. And uh, we have to uh, see it every day and uh, it's us who help our patients to the best. Well, so thank you all for attending today. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Senten too for their continuous support towards APGS educational activities. And uh, for the audience, please make sure you join us again in another uh, session for another two, uh, two webinars because the 2024 will be coming. And uh, of course, we have uh, the webinar in December as well. And you will find more details on these webinars on the screen. And as mentioned earlier, uh, all the audience will receive a short survey to provide your feedback on this event. Your participation will help us improve on future professional development offerings. We invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well, so you can be updated on our latest content. And this concludes the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society YGE program today. And I wish you all have a wonderful day or evening, and depending on where you are. And uh, thank you all again, and thank you all the panels. And you may now disconnect. Thank you, and thanks, Santin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a day. Have a good day. Bye.